40 in a biblical understanding, very important number. Uh, it can signify a biblical generation between 40 and 70, but it's also a time of preparation and it's a time of completion. Moses was in uh, his wilderness for 40 years. Jesus was tempted in the desert for 40 days. 40 is very symbolic and it, it leads a time of preparation to a time of completion and kind of a commissioning to something new. We want to stand on the shoulders of all that Don and the elders and the pastors and the congregation over the last 40 years since 1971, all that they have built, we want to stand on their shoulders and look forward uh, to building, should the Lord tarry, a church that impacts generation after generation to see the glory of the Lord cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. As you may already know, the Music Row, Belmont Hillsboro, Vandy, and Edge Hill neighborhoods are four of our city's most historic and eclectic communities. Steeped in creativity and progressive thinking, these neighborhoods continue to grow and thrive, setting the pace for the greater metropolitan Nashville area. Sitting on the corner of Music Square East and Grand Avenue, Belmont Church has long been an established participant within all these communities. The property which Belmont Church is built upon was originally purchased in January of 1911 and soon hosted a revival tent meeting. By April of 1911, a regular gathering of believers was taking place and those gatherings have continued to this day. The basement to the original building, now our conference center, was poured in 1915 and soon thereafter became the Belmont Avenue Church of Christ. We've seen Belmont go from a small, very small congregation, meeting just on Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesdays, locked up the rest of the week, to becoming a live body for the Lord. where the doors are just about always open. Something going on there all the time, every day of the week. Ministry going on, not just around our building, but all over town with our ministries, the bus ministry and everything. It just brings joy to your heart if you've been able to live long enough to see this marvelous change. It would be interesting if the youngsters there today could realize, and maybe they can through our comments, way back when it was just formal and programmed to being free to let the Spirit of the Lord erupt when He wanted to and do what He wanted to and change lives. And it's just been a marvelous experience. I think I first came to Belmont in 1967, I was a sophomore in college and there was a lot of stress in the world. The Vietnam War was underway. Civil rights movement, there were a lot of talking and thinking about what it meant to be a Christian. These were the critical issues of the day. I heard about a a Wednesday night class led by uh, Dr. Paul Phillips, who was a history teacher at uh, David Lipscomb College, and I started coming on Wednesday nights and continued to do that um, because of this very lively class. Um, we related to the neighborhood because Belmont was a neighborhood church. Uh, it, it reached out to the neighborhood, inviting children to come on Sundays. And then on Saturdays, um, Belmont Church opened up the building to a Saturday afternoon program called Play and Learn. And Lipscomb students volunteered. And for three hours every Saturday afternoon, we had uh, Play and Learn. And we uh, drove a bus into Edge Hill and brought children from the Edge Hill projects uh, for fun things, fun activities, art, uh, food, and of course, Bible classes on Saturday afternoons. I came in June of 1971. In fact, the interesting thing is, I already was sort of leaning toward coming to a place like this, and I was asked to come the year before. The elders had asked me to come in 1970, 
uh, because I was already in the middle of the what was the Jesus movement and there was still a kind of swirling that I was involved in <laughs> and uh, and my family wasn't ready to make the move and so I didn't but I really would probably have been ready to make the move a year earlier well then when I was no longer going to be at Lipscomb and I was no longer going to be at Unichurch of Christ the Belmont elders called me and said you've got the ministry and we've got the place for it why don't you come over here I'm a pastor at heart and when I came to Belmont there were not there were almost no churches in town that were really welcoming the Jesus people we were one of very few churches in town that was welcoming the Jesus people and I remember, for example, one time when uh, Walter Wyckoff, who was our oldest elder then, but um, I remember one time there was a fellow sitting on the front row and he had overalls on and didn't have a shirt. These kids came in with hair down to the shoulders and no shirt on, overalls, and barefooted <laughs> with a girl on his arm that had on the shortest shorts I've ever seen in my life. So we just... Uh, said, well, we'll have to come back again next Sunday to find out what we went for. Went back the next Sunday, and I didn't see that particular couple until I got inside. And there they sit, and there's one of the elders of the church sitting by them with his arm around this guy. And uh, Walter came up to me and said, who's the man on the front row? And I said, he's a guest. He said, oh, okay. Because if he was a guest, it was okay for him to, but if he was one of our people, he was going to tell him to put a shirt on. <laughs> it dawned on both of us what the attraction was. That Jesus was being lifted up. Done, all he talked about was Jesus. And that's what was drawing him there, was it was the real McCoy. Jesus was being lifted up. No sham, pretense, hypocrisy. And Don, had a problem preaching then because they kept coming and so many came that they were sitting all over the pulpit area up there and he couldn't move. He had to stand in one spot behind that foot because the kids were sitting there. They were sitting in the windows. It was wonderful. Uh, a friend of mine, Mike Bolden, who still goes to Belmont here, he and I came down to hear some announcements about the day camp that I was going to work at. And uh, boy, we walked in and uh, had an experience unlike anything we had ever had before. I couldn't have told you it was the Holy Spirit at that time, uh, but there was just a real sense of God's presence and, and a depth of fellowship that we had never had before. So we came to hear that announcement, and 40 years later, we've never gone anywhere else. When we moved back to Nashville in 75, Belmont, the modern version of Belmont was well underway, and I remember often, uh, if, if we didn't get here early, we basically sat behind the speaker on the stage because that was the last place left to sit. Uh, and for those that were really late, they could sit on the floor around the podium. Uh, but it was a packed house, people sitting up in the windows, um, the, the stained glass windows, those that people could reach, which were the first couple of windows, people were gonna sit there. Always there were extra chairs in the aisle. Uh, Brother Walter Wyckoff, I remember him, that was one of his regular duties to greet people and uh, to be adding the chairs. Pretty much I think we probably left them in after all because there was no need to take them out. They were always full. I think what happened in the 70s when I came here is that we really tapped into what God was doing. It wasn't like we tried to start anything. Right in the middle of the revival, we were almost not even aware of what was happening. We were baptizing dozens of people a month in rivers, bathtubs, swimming pools. I don't think we even realized what was happening. But what, what in retrospect, I think what was happening was that, that we tapped into what God was doing and He used us. And that's been my desire and my desire for everybody, that we tap into what God is doing now so that He can use us to fulfill His purposes. When we were trying to do things and trying to accomplish things for the Lord, nothing worked. But when we let go and let God, it's absolutely amazing. And we learned that from what was going on at Belmont. We quit trying to preach to young kids and just showed them Jesus. 
by our love for each other and for them, and that's what makes the difference. Within, you know, probably a year or two, uh, Cornelia Bookstore started, and it was sort of the, the seeds of the Christian music industry, really. We're a lot of years from that time, but they were just taking the rock and roll and the whatever styles, the folk styles, that uh, they were singing and writing new songs about the one that had loved them and changed their life. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday would be different teachers. Steve came there because there was water and he was a thirsty man. Friday night would be movies and then Saturday night was the praise, you know, was the praise giving. Cornelia was, uh, was filled with people who were hungry for fellowship. You had all this mixture of people together, but you did have a fellowship of people that were moving toward the Lord and it was, and bringing new people in all the time bringing new people, going out on the streets, witnessing on the streets, witnessing the parks. Koinonia carries with it the concept that it's a total sharing of life together. Man, we shared the victories, we shared the defeats, we shared the faith, we shared the doubts, the life, the death. It kept growing, and people came in from all walks of life all walks of life. I mean from, I mean it was, it, there, were, there wasn't anybody excluded from that. He pours out his spirit when and where he finds hearts that are hungry. We were surrounded with multitudes of hearts that were hungry. Don was really challenging people to read the Bible, to see what it had to say to you. Are there a group of young people somewhere that really just want to open the Bible together and just be original almost, you know, just dig in for themselves. They don't have to have commentaries and all those things. Just ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the Word to him. He will. And so uh, we took him up on that and we started reading First and Second Corinthians and Romans and uh, uh, boy, just the whole concept of the Holy Spirit being active and alive and moving in our lives uh, became a real hallmark in, in our lives and, and is to this day. And so just embracing the gifts of the Spirit, God's present working, His continuing to want to be uh, with us on a, on a daily basis, His empowering to help us follow Him, that was revolutionary to us. It's very interesting because here we were, a non-instrumental music Church of Christ, and all these, many of them Church of Christ background people, like Amy Grant, Chris Smith, Brown Bannister, Mike Blanton, uh, a lot of these people were Church of Christ background, and then along with a lot of others that weren't, but they started bringing their music to the coffee houses and we were just packing them out in the coffee houses and the coffee house at one point moved into the building. I mean, it wasn't a coffee house any longer, but it was more of a concert on Saturday night, but then all the instruments had to be moved out before Sunday morning. But all these people were coming in and they were going all over the world with their music, but they couldn't even play that music or sing those songs in their home congregation because they used instruments. And that was one of the things that began to, to rattle us about that not being right, even not being godly. And by this time, there were very few of us that had any kind of conviction against instrumental music. And on the contrary, many of us believed that if you're going to use instruments at all, you better use them to praise God. It happened on a Sunday evening. One of the young women who uh, had been writing songs and singing songs in Koinonia, she had had a song that she just wanted to share with the congregation and had asked an elder and he had said yes. He didn't even think about the fact that this is not coffee house, this is church. So Amy got up with that guitar and bless you, she played and sang a song that she had written and it was absolutely wonderful. <laughs> to me and Catherine. Oh my goodness, how wild can we be, you know? That was the first instrument that was played here, was just a, a young girl with a simple guitar, and uh, 
boy, by the next Sunday, the elders had met several times. And that's when we made the elders' decision that we were not any longer a non-instrumental music church. And that's the way Amy Grant broke the ice at Belmont. Belmont began to be a happening place, and at one time we tried to have five assemblies on Sunday, two Sunday morning, one in the afternoon, two in the evening. There were times when we had over 500 people in that little building sitting in window seals on the stage, down the aisles, over the sound system in the back, sp spilling out the back door. I mean, they were all over this end. We wondered if we should put loudspeakers outside because we were trying to figure out how do we serve these people. Back when we were coming here in the early 80s, I, you, know, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is what was going on in this building. And um, what I especially remember is um, I believe it was every three months we had a, um, could have been every month, but I think it was every th every three months, we would sort of blow it out here on a Sunday night. And um, I mean, people were sitting up on these window seals, you know, just the move of God and the worship that happened in here was uh, pretty overwhelming. We thought the roof was going to sort of come off at times, but it was just the presence of God was thick and uh, we just couldn't get enough of it. You know, I'm a, I'm a better man today because of my life here. Uh, I'll never forget actually walking into this, this building right here and, uh, and connecting with Fento, Papa Don. And I thought, hmm, I might need to make this place my home. And uh, it changed my life. I actually played on the stage. This is the, my, my first worship gig. Uh, but leading worship was, yeah, it was on the stage. And um, it was awesome. Back in 1983, Belmont had grown to such a point that we were having five services on Sunday. It was just an unmanageable kind of schedule. Now, and I had come on staff in 1980, and so the elders said, we need to do something else. What else can we do? And so we looked around, and uh, we decided we might try to build down here, but we didn't know. But in 1983, we moved to West End Middle School several times the issue came up because of our different growth phases when we were considering building a building and where would we build it. We were having an elders meeting about whether to move off the corner and so we met at a hotel. We were meeting in the, in the side room off of a hotel. But always we would come back to feeling called. I think the elders felt called to stay on this corner and as I remember it, it would often be said we're kind of at the crossroads. Finally, the Spirit of God fell on me, and I got up and I said, brothers, I'm sure that I've sinned against all of you at some point, please forgive me. And you probably sinned against me, I speak forgiveness to you. If you want to go to the suburbs, please go right ahead, but I cannot be your pastor. I'm not called to the suburbs. I probably, what would I do? Maybe I'd rent a storefront, I don't know. Finally, the, in 1986, I think it was, Don said, I'm called to be downtown. And so if the church needs to go to the suburbs, that's fine. I just need to be downtown. Well, the elders said, we're with you. We're going back down there. We bought the lot next to us. And so we decided to build. And, that's, and so it took 87 into 88 to get it built and finish and so that was sort of a, a neat journeying time of just saying Lord what are we called to be and, and Belmont in its identity is just called to be a church of the city. This is where God planted us let's stay here and we finally end up able to build and move into our new worship center and classroom space and office space in 1988. And I remember it real well because there was a huge oak pulpit and I got behind that thing and I felt like I was in one of those exalted pulpits in the historical churches of Europe. And I felt like I was 10 miles from the nearest person out there. I was so tight because I'd been used to stepping over people to get to the pulpit to speak. <laughs> and, and I got rid of that thing. I think the first week I just said I can't handle that. And I, I didn't, I pushed it back. I couldn't speak. I felt too far away from everybody. Don Fento, a pastor here from 71 to 97. I began to believe when I was already past 65 that um, on the basis of a scripture that God used in Numbers 8, 
that when the Levites were, in this case, past 50, they were no longer to do the work, but to assist the people doing it. And I began to believe that I needed to step back from the being senior pastor and pour my life into younger people that would move up and take their place. And so we began very uh, decisively to move forward to try to find that pastor that we'd turn the congregation over with. Stephen Mansfield from uh, 97 to 2002 uh, brought a, a real sense of destiny, that God has a destiny for us as a body, but God has a destiny for you as individuals. And so I would say that's probably the main message that uh, Stephen brought. Chronicles is different from Kings. Kings is history written as a lawsuit. Chronicles is history written to impart a sense of purpose, writing history to impart destiny. Well, when Steve Mansfield became pastor, he said to us, I don't believe that I'm a gifted pastor, but I believe I'm gifted to raise up a pastoral team. And he was, he was good at that. And he did raise up a good pastoral team. And then uh, Steve Fry brought a message of, of just uh, holiness and worship to the Lord. Revelation always precedes warfare. God wants to impart the spirit of revelation to us constantly so that we can walk in effectual warfare. But then Steve Fry was also, I mean, a godly man and a godly family that uh, brought all of his pieces that he had had working with youth from the very first, always, even from young years, committed to the Lord. So he brought that to us, and we thought it was going to be forever, but it was for a season, and so we praise God and move on. And now we have Brian who continues to bring a message of God's relevance to today. It's that you might encounter the living God and have a relationship with Him. I was the one who was like chair of the searching. We had about three candidates on the list and um, after we got those three candidates and really started looking at them, uh, Brian came to our attention. I got some of his tapes that just had happened in the last few weeks. Uh, we had a couple of elders that actually went up to Nashville, Indiana to hear him and uh, came back with just some really uh, positive comments uh, about Brian. Uh, after doing some praying and really seeking God about it, felt like Brian was the one that we uh, were to extend the invitation to come and be the pastor here at Belmont. May the Lord really bring Belmont into that volcanic eruption again so that they become a part of what God wants them to be for the future. I actually have a picture that somebody gave me of a volcano because I saw, I felt like I heard the Lord say that Belmont was like a volcano. And I didn't understand what he was saying and then I realized that a volcano erupts and then it lies fallow for a while and then it erupts again. And I think we've gone through some fallow years. But my prayer is that there can be such a strength of people here that are seeking the Lord, that there will be a godly eruption here that will impact the whole city and the whole area as we are impacting the world in many ways. Please.